So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Be Well, Learn Well webinar. Just before we get started, in order to make sure that everything is working as it should be, could somebody please on the chat or questions function just confirm that you can hear me OK? Wonderful. I think that is working as it should be. So. Great. My name is Gracie Madison and I work in the marketing team here at Macmillan International Higher Education. Uh, it's so exciting to see so many of you joining from all around the country. Um, but don't worry, no one's on webcam and everyone's audio is muted so we can just maintain the quality of the webinar throughout. Uh, the, the audio and the video is also being recorded, so if you would like to view the webinar again after it has finished, then we'll be sending around a copy to everyone. I'd like to invite everyone to ask questions throughout the session using the questions box. And then after the session, there'll be an opportunity for Gareth to answer some of your questions. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Gareth Hughes, who is a psychotherapist and research lead for student wellbeing at the University of Derby as well as the lead author of the University Mental Health Charter. The topic of today's webinar is centred around many of the themes within Gareth's new book, Be Well, Learn Well, which we are thoroughly proud to be publishing in mid-September of this year. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Gareth. Thank you, Gracie, and thank you very much, everyone, for, for being here today and for um, wanting to know more about how we can support our students to, to both be well and learn well. Um, I suppose the, the, the key thing we're going to be looking at today in, in the webinar is, is the, about the balance between how students can maintain their well-being and how they can continue to learn well and achieve academically overall. There's sometimes a little bit of a tension, I think, in the way this is talked about, and I know there have been some articles um, where there's kind of been a suggestion that really in order to maintain well-being, um, sorry, in order to achieve academically, students may need to sacrifice their well-being or a concern that those of us who talk about the need to focus on student well-being actually want to kind of lower academic standards in order to, to enable us to focus on their well-being and not stress students out. And I think really the evidence just doesn't stack up for that. It, it doesn't really hold together in that way. And so what I want to do today is just go through some of the reasons why I think that's the case. Um, and then just look at some of the ways in which we may think about how we can help our students um, to, to, to be successful academically. Now, obviously, we're in a very particular moment in a very particular time um, with everything going on with COVID-19. So I'm going to talk very generally um, so that we, what, what I talk about is will hopefully apply now and outside of COVID-19. But obviously, in the questions, if you want to ask things which are specific to what's happening right now, please feel free to do so. So I think there's a number of ways of, of, of thinking about um, well-being and its relationship to academic performance overall. Um, and in particular, I think there are a number of models of well-being and a number of models of, of how we learn and think about all of this. Um, but it, it, it's not particularly a, a, oh, we've jumped on a, a slide a bit more than I meant to. Sorry, there we go. Um, I think if we look at um, the, the way in which student mental health is being talked about at the moment within the sector as a whole, um, there's obviously a great deal of worry about um, student mental health and it's been building over a number of years. We've seen lots of concern in newspapers, lots of concern in um, reports that are being issued, uh, government ministers who have been particularly concerned about this overall. And so I think there's, there's a, um, a, 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 an understandable concern about exactly what is going on within the sector. It's difficult to really assess it, what the actual um, situation is on the ground because we don't at the moment have any large scale population studies of students as a whole across the whole of the UK. There have been some fairly large scale studies done within individual universities. So the University of Ulster, for instance, I know, I think got more or less 80% of their first year students in, in some research that they did to assess the well-being of their population. But we don't have it across the whole institute, or the whole of the UK, so it's difficult to know exactly what is going on, exactly how many students are experiencing this, and whether we're actually seeing a rise in mental illness, or whether this is something that's always been around and we're just picking it up now for the first time. Irrespective of all of that, I think what we do know is that the level of need is actually really very high, um, and certainly much higher than we should be comfortable with. So whether this is growth or not, it's certainly not something that we can be comfortable with. We've definitely seen an increase in demand on services in the last five years, so on counselling teams and mental health teams, more than doubling, 150% um, in some, some of the reports that I've seen 
Um, and certainly within the service that I work in at Derby, that, that would very much prove to be the case. Um, and this really then does have consequences for the experiences that our students have, how they feel about university overall, but also I think um, for their well-being and for their academic performance, because th there is no question that well-being does impact on the performance of our students, on their ability to learn, um, and on their ability to engage with the, the, the kind of their academic career overall. Um, so if we think about the way in which that interaction happens then, this is a, a model that I've used for a number of years when talking to students and helping them to understand it. And what we talk about within this, if you think about students' physical health, psychological health and social health, that gets filtered through their academic skill, the effort they make and their approach to their learning overall to produce academic performance. So academic performance is the combination of the skill, talent, ability, effort, and the way students try to learn and their well-being overall. And if you think about that from, let's think if we think about physical health, you know that if a student has a cold or the flu or what, some kind of you know, physical ailment, then their ability to focus on their academic work, to concentrate, to stay motivated, to think creative thoughts, obviously is much reduced as a result of all of that. Whereas if they're in good physical health, if they have lots of energy, if they feel energized, then focusing academically much easier. So I'm going to break down that a little bit more as we work through the session today. But I think one of the things that you'll notice that the arrows actually run in two directions. And that's because the way in which students engage with their learning and with their academic performance also has impact on their well-being. So this is a, this is a, a transactional relationship between these different parts of, of, of their experience between their academic life and their own personal well-being. Um, and I think that's a really important part to get to this. Now, my own journey through this, I started out being very concerned about student well-being and student mental health um, because I saw the impact that it was having on them and on their learning. But then the more you dig into the research, the more you understand, the more you look at learning, the more you understand that actually there, there's a relationship going in the other direction between learning and academic performance as well. And so we need to be as concerned um, about both areas. Um, so I've just got a little delay on the slide. Yeah, there we go. So if we start by thinking about um, physical well-being and students' physical needs and how all of that works together. So you'll see we have a student in the middle here with their huge stack of books that, of course, all students are still reading. Um, I wish. Um, and then look around the outside of that at sort of different aspects of their physical health and their physical experience. And we'll start with sleep because it's the one that I'm probably most interested in, and people who know me know I could rattle on about student sleep and the importance of it for uh, probably days at a time if I wasn't interrupted. So if we think about sleep, then we know that sleep has huge impact on well-being, obviously. So if we think about its impact on physical well-being, we know the body repairs itself during sleep. Um, it builds up energy levels. So the glia cells top up overnight with glucose in order that we have energy to the rest in the next day. It helps us to overcome illness. So really important for physical well-being. Really important also for, for mental well-being because we know that lack of sleep and poor sleep is implicated in all kinds of mental illnesses. So anxiety, um, sleep disorder is implicated in depression as well. But even some of the, the, the more extreme um, illnesses that people might experience, if you think about things like psychotic disorders, things like bipolar disorder, very often um, preceded by periods of sleeplessness. So really very important to our well-being overall, but also really important to our learning. So we do three things in sleep to do with our learning. The first thing is we appear to clear out the clutter from the previous day. So we, we, we free up memory space so that we can learn more the next day. We also appear to consolidate our learning overnight so that the things that we've learned that are really important move into our long-term memory while we're asleep. And then the final thing is that we actually appear to do some problem solving while we're asleep. So if you set students a really difficult problem and then send them away to have a sleep and then bring them back to it, they're more likely to be able to solve that problem when they come back to it than if they'd gone off and done something else other than sleeping. Now, there is a fourth thing which applies to some students, which is there's a muscle memory thing that seems to happen in sleep as well in a different phase of sleep. But students who are, for instance, musicians trying to play a difficult musical piece, more likely to be able to play it after, if they've had a good sleep and then come back to it. But that also then follows for, say, nursing students who are learning to syringe or students in labs who are learning those kinds of things will benefit from good sleep. So really very clearly linked all ways around. And I think this is the thing we see as we start moving through all of this is that Everything is connected for human beings. You know, Descartes was wrong. Everything is, is, is brought together. We are um, a kind of one holistic entity and all our experiences link and connect to each other. They aren't separated out into separate boxes. 
So also, you know, you, you might look then at a, a diet, and we know there's a link between food and mood. Students who try to survive on high sugar, high fat, high caffeine diets will have spikes in their mood overall, um, followed by huge plunges. But also there's a real clear evidence that a good healthy diet can help you maintain concentration, maintain motivation, uh, and your, your academic performance can be better. Exercise, we know exercise is, is more effective at managing anxiety than medication very often and also has been implicated in helping to improve academic performance. There's a really interesting experiment with sunlight where they looked at um, children in a classroom with, with windows and sunlight and children in a classroom without. The classroom with windows and sunlight outperformed those without. So again, we are part of our natural environment and we know that being around nature, being connected to nature, spending time mindfully in nature, really good for our well-being overall and helpful to our students. Um, so, all of this is connected, as I say, um, physical needs very much connected to our emotional needs, our social needs, and our academic performance. Then we come to our psychological well-being. So um, for, for any neuroscientists uh, on or any psych biological psychologists who are watching today, I'm about to simplify something. Apologies for that, but it is true overall. So when I talk to students about this, what I'd say is I'll ask for a show of hands and I'll say, give me a quick show of hands if you've ever been studying for an exam you were really nervous about and realized you just read the same page three times not taking in a single word. Or you'd gone in, sat down in an exam room that you were, to sit in an exam you were nervous about and suddenly realized you'd gone completely blank. And those things are examples of what we call emotional hijacking. So we have a part of our brain called the amygdala which basically functions as like the brain security officer is one of its roles. And it's constantly monitoring the environment and your internal thoughts and systems, looking out for anything that might indicate you're at threat. And if you are in danger, it triggers what we call the fight, flight, freeze mechanism. So it speeds up your heart, sends blood pumping to your muscles, heightens your senses. And it's getting you ready to fight off whatever is dangerous, run away from it, or freeze so that it doesn't notice you or thinks you're not worth bothering with. But it does another really interesting thing. To the degree that it picks up risk, it sends cascading chemical signals up into the front part of our brain, up into the prefrontal cortex. And it damps it down. Those chemical signals just kind of damp that down or completely switch. That's why you can go completely and totally blank. Now, that might seem a bit odd. Why might that happen? Well, if you imagine being in the wild somewhere where there are poisonous snakes, and up ahead you see something that might be a stick or might be a poisonous snake, you don't actually want that part of your brain getting involved because in brain processing terms, it's very slow and it's going to start complicating things. It's going to start asking, are you a stick? Are you a snake? Are you a poisonous snake? Are you going to bite me? By which time you've been bitten and you're in trouble. So what happens is the front bit of your brain just gets switched off, the amygdala takes control, and the body jumps back. Now, if it's a stick, you'll feel a bit silly, but you're still alive. If it's a poison snake, it just saved your life. But that's really important then for our students to understand that, that that blanking is a normal response to being afraid of something. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with their brain. It doesn't mean they're not academically capable. It just means they're anxious and their brain has responded to anxiety in the way our brains do. And if we then manage that anxiety through breathing techniques or relaxation techniques or whatever it is that we do to help us get calm, our brain will come back online and we can refocus. The key bit is that students don't just try and push themselves through. Because when that happens, you get frustrated, you lose more of that front part of your brain, work gets even more difficult, and you go in a negative spiral. So we need students to stop, move back, calm, then re-engage with their work, then come back to the screen. Um, now, the, the, the challenge for us in education is about then trying to get that balance right for students. Because what I'm not arguing is that we should, what we should do is never put students in situations where they're being stretched. Because actually, being stretched is good for you. Being challenged is good for us. But what we're looking for here is what, what's what called in the education literature, desirable difficulty. We want to push students just in to, just outside their um, little zone of comfort that they have, just outside that, so that they're being stretched just enough, so that it feels a little bit uncomfortable, but not more than that. Because when we feel stretched, when we're in that zone of, of, of discomfort where they're just outside your comfort zone, you're being challenged, but you'll still believe that you can do this. You'll still believe that you can achieve. You'll feel supported. You'll feel you have the resources to call in to help you do it. You'll feel motivated because you believe it's possible. And as a result, you get improved performance overall. Whereas when students are stressed, when they have those high levels of stress and the stress is ongoing, they're more likely then to feel overwhelmed, to feel that the success is not possible for them, and then they're more likely to feel that they've been abandoned, that they're on their own, that no one understands, then they get anxious, and then they get that mental freezing. 
So the trick for us in academia and in education is to try and move our students into a bit where they're being stretched, but not into the place where they're being stressed overall, because that then can be um, harmful overall uh, otherwise, and can then impact on their learning, because as I said, they've not got access to that part of the brain, so their performance doesn't benefit. So stressing our students out to try and improve academic performance actually doesn't particularly work very well, but stretching them does. Now, the other bit, I talked about the, the holistic nature of all of this and how it's all connected. And I think the social well-being aspect is the bit that probably explains that best. And this is from work by social neuroscientists like John Cacioppo, which looked at the impact of loneliness. And what we know is that when an individual perceives themselves as being lonely, and that's the key bit, the perception of loneliness, not how much time they're spending with other people, when they perceive themselves to be lonely, cognitive functioning drops. So their ability to think complex thoughts drops. Their mood also drops. And there's also an impact on immunity. So if you give two groups of people the cold virus, one group who feel lonely and another who don't, the group who are lonely are more likely to go on to develop the cold from that virus. And there's also research that shows that it particularly impacts on academic performance for students. So students who feel lonely have a reduced academic performance as a result. Because as I say, all of this is connected. That sense of connectedness reduces academic performance. So these things are all linked together. So that's why all of the stuff that we do at the beginning of, a, of an academic year, when we're helping to build cohort identity, we're bringing students together and bonding them, we're giving them opportunities to make new friends. And that sense of belonging at university is so important to our students because without that, they're, they're less likely to, to learn as well. Now, but I said, this works in both directions and it does. So this is the kind of work that looks at deep and surface learning, particularly I'm going to pull on today. Um, and deep learning is when students engage with things, as the title suggests, in a, in a deeper way, when they're, they're studying for meaning, they're studying for understanding, they link things together, they connect their learning to previous learning, they're interested in going out and researching more, um, they're building a kind of narratively cohesive understanding of all of the stuff that they're learning together. Now, those students, unsurprisingly, tend to achieve really well. They also have good well-being, and they're more satisfied with their teaching experience and learning experience at university. Students who focus on surface learning, and surface learning is where students focus on what they need to know in order to do the assignment. What is it I need and I don't need anything else? They tend to study to regurgitate rather than to understand, and they study things in isolation rather than connecting them together. Again, unsurprisingly, those students tend to achieve less as a result of that. That focus on, that narrower focus means they achieve less overall. They also tend to have poorer well-being, in particular, they're likely to have higher anxiety. And they're more likely to need other people to help them manage when they get into difficulty rather than to manage themselves. And they're generally less satisfied with their teaching and learning experience overall. Now, the researchers who looked at this, people like Lisa Posteref, who have looked at this kind of thing, have said that actually the link really is through motivation. Students who are deep learning are intrinsically motivated. And what that means is their learning is meaningful to them. They're passionate about it. They're deriving lots of positive well-being from their learning. Learning is good for them. They get pleasure, they get enjoyment, they get a sense of competence and achievement out of it. They get that sense of the, the, being focused on something which is purposeful and meaningful. Students who are surface learning are focused on not failing. And therefore, learning can become a threat area for them. The, the, the piece of academic work they're doing is a threat because they might not do as well as they want, or they might fail it overall, and that will be a judgment on them. And so then, learning and academic performance becomes something to worry about and to be concerned about because they're focused on those extrinsic things like grades and other people's judgments of them and the risk of that going wrong. Now, we all have a balance between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation generally, and students will also move around between the two motivations depending on the module they're studying and so on. But a balance which is more towards intrinsic motivation is definitely better for our well-being overall and for our learning. And what's really interesting about this is the actually well-being also drives the way students engage with that learning overall. So we've known since the 1970s that students who feel anxious about their learning are more likely to adopt ineffective study practices. So if you think about exam anxiety, for instance, students who experience exam anxiety are far more likely to do very superficial surface level revision to do the kind of reading your notes or highlighting your notes strategies, which we know aren't as effective. And what happens as a result of that is there's a spiral that gets created in which the student feels anxious adopts poor study skills or avoids studying completely because the anxiety makes them want to avoid it so they back away completely and they ignore it and try to pretend it's not happening. That then results in underperformance, performance which convinces the students that they're just academically not very able which makes them more anxious about the next piece of work they have to do and you get this whole anxious loop 
going round and round and round, sustaining itself. But if you can get in at any point of this and change this loop, so if you can change the way that they're studying so that this, they begin to study in a much more effective way, maybe using retrieval practice or spacing, um, or if you can help to calm the anxiety initially so that they don't start avoiding and can think more clearly about what might be useful. And if we can up the performance so that it changes their perspective of, of, of themselves and how they can perform, then you can change this loop and you can make it a more positive one. And what we see with students who aren't anxious and who are confident and enjoy their learning is that there's a different loop where they feel confident, therefore they adopt effective revision strategy, which results in good performance, which makes them more confident, and you get a positive spiral then moving in the other direction. So those aspects of learning that we need to care about then is, is students feeling that sense of mastery or what we would call academic self-efficacy. So that, that means that students believe they are capable of achieving whatever they've been set. So they look at the work and think, oh, it might be challenging, it might be difficult, but I know I can get there because I believe I have the skills. Attribution, which is that when students do well, they actually attribute it to them being good. And you quite often see with students who experience perfectionism, for instance, that they will get 80% and you go, wow, that's amazing, you got 80% and they'll go, yeah, it must just have been easy even though other people in the class got nowhere near that, that mark, the, immediately the attribution goes to, well, the easiness of it, rather than it's because actually I did really well. The meaning that students derive from it, so the depth of learning that they're doing, so that they're getting meaning and purpose from their learning. And then the relationship overall, how much they are focused on grades or not. Now, generally what we know is grades tend to impact immediately on student well-being less than students think it will. So a good grade doesn't make them as happy as they think it will, and it doesn't last for as long as they think it will, that boost to their happiness. And a poor grade doesn't tend to make them feel as bad as they think it will, or last as long as they think it will. But if you get a consistent picture where students are consistently underperforming, then that can have an impact. Or where students have a real fixation with grades, because that can change that then. A bad grade then can mean a really bad impact on their well-being overall, which can then trigger all of that spiral. So what this means is that for our students, being well and learning well are just inextricably linked. So improving their well-being can help to improve their learning. If we can improve their learning, that can also help to improve their well-being overall. So if we can do that in a sustained way, if we can guide our students through to helping them improve their learning and improve their well-being, we'll see benefits at both ends. Now, different things work for different people and the right place to start will be different for different students. This is a very individual thing. The journey through to improving this is a very individual thing. So what we need to do really is be giving students lots of opportunity to encounter lessons and ideas, which give them lots of, of, of thoughts about the thing that they could start with, the, the, the first domino that could get them moving. So I'm gonna share just some ideas um, of things that, 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 that possibly might help students, some ideas of things that we know can improve well-being and learning overall. I'm gonna rattle through quite a few of them because I'm just gonna scatter a few out. The recording will there to, to help you come back to it if I move through it too quickly for you. Um, and we'll begin just by thinking about the, the improving well-being to improve learning aspect of all of this. I'll begin with, with structure and routine because the ba a good balanced structure and routine is one of the key elements of all of this for many of our students. So if we think about the different ends of the spectrum for this, sometimes I see students who will arrive with me in the therapy room having had a, a diagnosis of depression potentially from a GP. And I'll talk to them about, well, what's happening in your day today? What's going on? And they'll say, well, I'm getting up about 12, maybe going on the PlayStation for a few hours, then I have a shower, I have something to eat, talk to my friends. The day's drifted by again, it's the middle of the night, I go on the PlayStation until two in the morning, then I go to sleep. And, and that lifestyle, even if you started off perfectly he healthy and well, on its own would start to lower your mood and move you towards depression. Um, so getting those students into a much more productive routine, into a much more um, regular routine. Human beings benefit from a regular routine. Regular routines benefit our physical health and benefit our sleep overall. We think having nothing to do and, and having a structureless day would be really good, but actually it's not. You see this in people who retire. Those who, who give themselves a clear routine and structure to their day benefit much more from retirement than those who don't. But if we then go to the opposite end of the spectrum, we also have students who are maybe mature students who have got caring responsibilities, have, have children, are also working while studying full-time as well, and have a routine that's absolutely packed where there might not be any space for them to look after themselves, where they're, they're just going to try and push through for three years what is a, a structure and a routine that really isn't sustainable. 
Um, and that's not to say you can't study with children on a job because loads of students do it and they do it incredibly well and incredibly effectively. But it is that while doing that, you do need to give yourself some space. We do need to be encouraging them to do something to look after their own well-being so that they can sustain this for the three years. Improving sleep, we've talked about earlier, and there are, there are tips in the book about improving sleep, but, but you can find some online to guide students as well. Exercise, students are very often surprised to discover that physical exercise benefits your, your mental performance. Getting that balance of fun, study, and work, and we need all of those aspects in order to be able to thrive as being a student. Fun is really important, but not overdoing it, particularly at the beginning of the first year, not overdoing it too much, but also not switching it off completely when there are assignments due or when there are exams due, because we still need a release. We still need that to let off stress. And one of the things that worries me very often, particularly around air levels and things like that, is you see parents telling their children, right, that's it, all your hobbies have now got to stop so you can focus on studying. And what happens is all the things that, that the, the student has around them that help them manage stress really successfully just get switched off as a result and their stress levels rocket. So having a bit of fun and a bit of free time, even when we've got academic work coming up, can help uh, our well-being and our academic performance. Diet and hydration we talked about earlier as well. Hydration is an interesting one. Staying hydrated in an exam appears to be able to, to boost your academic performance, particularly long like our exams like three hour exams so if you just keep topping up your hydration levels it helps your brain to keep functioning socializing as we said we need that mix of social life we are not um isolated creatures that do well from being isolated with each other we are a herd animal we, we need to be around other people we also need a little bit of time and space to ourselves and then reflective learning i think is a is a skill which can be developed in students but it's something that usually they don't have when they first arrive with us at university so helping students to develop that reflective learning so that they can then attribute their success to themselves, notice the growth and development that they're actually going through, and then they can feel more confident as a student overall. And then in terms of psychological well-being, there are some very simple things that we can do to help us. Now, these aren't solutions to, you know, um, somebody who's, who's experiencing significant mental illness. They may need some more help with this, although these will still benefit them. Um, but these are things that can definitely help with our psychological well-being. So relaxation exercises, things like breathing exercises, progressive muscle re relaxation. Again, you can find guidance online on how to do all of this. And there are exercises in the book for students to do. Can help you calm your whole system, calm your brain down, help you to focus, which is a really important part of all this, help you to focus on the work that you want to do, or just to focus on where you are in that moment so that your well-being benefits from it. And having a calm system in that way can help you be more productive overall. Then becoming aware of those anxiety loops and mental phrasing and acting on them, so not just trying to push through them, but stepping back, calming yourself down, then stepping back to your work. Nature, as I said, there's some really interesting work my colleagues at, at Derby have done, people like Miles Richardson, looking at the impact of being mindfully engaged with nature. And we know that if you spend 10 minutes a day focusing on something in nature, a tree, a bird, whatever it is, that has a measurable impact on your well-being. And it's a well-being that it, it's an impact that sustains. So if you there, if you did that for a month, your well-being would improve. And then if you stopped doing it, but then measured your well-being a month later, you'd find that the impact was still there. So it's, it's kind of a pulled impact. Music we know can change your mood more quickly than anything else. So listening to good music that you that you like for 15 minutes a day can have a positive impact on your well-being. Talking to others helps you to reframe things, helps you to get a different perspective, helps you to feel noticed and cared about. It's that social thing that we talked about again. Gratitude practice can be really useful in helping students sometimes to reset and feel less anxious because um, that thing of just thinking three or four times a week, what am I grateful for today? And if those things repeat, it doesn't really matter, but they can be small things. You know, I was grateful today. I had a really nice cup of coffee with a friend. Those things help you just to focus on life and take you out of the kind of anxious projections that sometimes our students have about the future and focus them in actually there are things in my life that are good and are solid and I, I can be okay with that. There's good evidence behind things like yoga and mindfulness that they are really good for well-being overall and really good for cognitive functioning which will benefit learning and then fun as we talked about we do need fun in our lives we can't just work 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 we do need some pleasure in order for our well-being to be good. Now again different things work for different people um, we know for instance that mindfulness is really good for most people some people get no impact from it some people actually, mindfulness isn't very good for at all. Some people actually experience a negative impact from mindfulness. So it's different things for different people. And it's about helping our students to have a menu of things that they can think about to go and select to help them improve. 
And then in terms of improving our learning, there's some really good evidence of the things that actually do help our students improve their learning. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is that moving into deep learning. Um, and it's important for students to find that intrinsic emotional connection with the subjects they're learning. So I often say to students when they've got an assignment, think about what you've been asked to do, get clarity on what you've been asked to do, look at the marking brief so you know exactly what it is you're being asked to produce overall, but then think about why do you care? What is it about this piece of work that makes you passionate, that makes you interested, that makes you frustrated, that makes you, that you would change in the world if you possibly could? Find that positive emotional connection to what it is that you want to write so that that can drive you because if you're working on something that you care about and are interested in and are passionate about it feels less like work and you're much more motivated to sit down and do it you'll give it more time um, and then that deeper connection means you're more likely to do better work we know that practices like spacing so spacing out learning so learning on one day then coming back to it three days later then seven days later then 14 days that that allowing you to forget things and then remind yourself of them that builds that memory and the ability to retrieve that memory much more strongly. Retrieval practice, so basically testing yourself. And, and this is one of the really interesting things is that assessments that we often do with students actually are probably more useful in that they benefit learning than that we get to see how well they've learned. Um, so testing practice, getting students to test themselves, or if we're in a classroom, just going back over the, the, the previous week by going around the classroom and going, okay, who remembers this, who remembers that? That retrieval practice benefits learning overall. Notes taking in lectures and in class can really help, particularly if students then go away and rewrite the notes afterwards. That practice of going through those two things seems to build up understanding much more. Studying for depth, studying for meaning and connection and encouraging our students and helping them to develop the skill to do that. Then that attribution stuff, noticing improvement and growth. Being aware of distractions is a really important one. So we know that if you have something like this, mobile phone sitting beside you on your desk, and you've got your notification switched on while you're studying, that actually reduces your cognitive functioning. It reduces your ability to concentrate because part of your brain continues to monitor the phone for incoming messages. The same is true if you've got um, social media switched on on your computer or you've got your notification switched on on your computer. Part of your brain is distracted from what you're doing onto that. And we know that we don't, we don't multitask, it's just attention splitting. So you're much better to just switch all those distractions off and focus in on the one thing you're doing and then come back to those as a reward afterwards. And then lastly, embracing doubt. So being okay with not knowing. You know, the whole foundation of science and learning is based on the phrase, we don't know. Therefore, we're going to try and find out. And if our students knew everything they needed to know um, when they first arrived at university, then they wouldn't need to do a three-year degree because they'd already know it all. So not knowing is the foundation of being a student. But many of our students feel that there's something wrong with them if they don't know everything or don't understand everything straight away. So helping them to become comfortable with what is the actual the process of learning. And the process of learning is moving from not knowing through doubt, building your understanding, then moving through those kind of threshold concepts into understanding and knowledge, which then gives you a platform for the next phase of your learning. Helping them to understand that would reduce a lot of the anxiety and stress that many of our students experience. So what we're basically saying is all through this is being well and learning well are not an opposition. And if we can help our students to develop and improve their well-being and their learning, they will have effect on it. And our students will then be in a position where they can flourish and thrive at university and achieve beyond what they probably expected for themselves and have a really good time at university. And we can hopefully reduce this kind of poor well-being that we're seeing in the student population. Um, and it means that more of our students will view their time at university as being really good and really positive and really enjoyable. I mean, I had a fantastic time when I went to university and I'm not happy to be, to, to, for us to settle for that being the case for, for everyone. Everyone should have a great time at university wherever possible. This, all of our students should enjoy it, should be passionate about it, should learn a lot, should come away and feel that they'd grown and developed and that they really valued the time they had at university and we're really glad they went. And, and we shouldn't be satisfied with anything less than that. So hopefully the book will help. Um, I'll, I'll let Gracie come back in and talk about how you can access all of this. Um, it's out in mid-September and, and hopefully your students will use it and read it and, and, and we'll get some benefit out of it. But I hope that today has been useful and I look forward to your questions. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Gareth. That was really fascinating and a subject for us, I think, all to consider in our lives, not just for students. Um, 
if you do have questions, I would invite you to um, type those into the questions box now um, and we will have some time now to, to answer those. So I'm going to start with a question uh, for you, Gareth, from Simon, who's asking, with limited face-to-face -face learning interactions for year one students, particularly at university, who don't know each other, what are your thoughts in addressing issues of socialisation, uh, isolation, making friends, etc., and the challenges they face um, ensuring their well-being? Yeah, I think it is one of the one of my biggest concerns for the year coming up as well. Actually, is what happens to students in terms of that social interaction. So it's a good point, Simon. You're quite right to raise it. I mean, I think we have to be thinking about using. Um, as much of the resource we have available. So anytime you do have in the classroom, if you can do any work to help build connection and cohort identity, tricky with social distancing, I know, but if you can do little pieces of group work um, to just help people have that little bit more connection with each other, but then be using online forums. So again, teach your students to use whatever online platform you're using, but if you can use breakout rooms and give them time and space to talk to each other generally, as well as talking about the specific task you're, what you're asking them to work on. Um, if, if you can set up online spaces that students can use to talk to each other outside class so that they have a place to go to share their concerns. And then reiterating to them how important all of this is and encouraging them to use the social opportunities they have, both within the cohort, the, within the class, but also within student unions. Student unions are still operating. Some of what they do is online, some of it's in person, but socially distanced. Um, Th that it's still important that they 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 take up those opportunities that they are making that social connection with other people uh, and being explicit about the fact that you feel it's important because when students feel that their lecturers feel it's important they are more likely to act on it um, so just you saying that it's important and giving people time to talk to each other even in online classes in breakout rooms whatever it is if you just do some icebreaker sessions in in rooms or whatever it is um, those things can really help um, and we just need to keep focused on it as the year's going on because it's it's going to be tricky. We can, at least students can now come together and see each other even if it's in a socially distanced way. So encouraging that wherever we possibly can is really would, would be really helpful. Um, but we're going to have to be working it out as we go along, I think. Okay, thank you, Gareth. Um, now we have a question from Amy uh, who would like to know, what would your suggestions be of how to approach changing students' mindsets from surface to deep level learning? Yeah, it's really tricky because the thing we've got to remember is that most of our students, certainly in the UK, are arriving from an education sector that's drilled them in surface learning. Um, our education system has very much moved to end of, end of school exams and students are being taught to the exam um, and are being discouraged from doing wider reading. Actually, in many cases, they're being told, don't bother with all of that, just focus on this is what you need to do for the exam, do that. So it's a bit of a shock to them when they come in and some of them will think that they're not being taught properly when we ask them to move from surface to deep learning and to be more responsible for their own learning. I think the response has to be, well, there's a number of things, but I think we need to be using scaffolding. We need to accept that that's where they're coming in. Start talking to them very early on about the fact that, 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 that we need to move them from one to the other and why this is a good thing, why this is going to be a thing we need to do. Think about how you're using assessment for learning. Think about whether your assessments are pushing students into that deep learning space. One of the reasons I quite like is because students are less able to predict what they're going to be asked um, and because the conversation could, could move in different ways, it kind of moves students towards having to do deep learning. But getting your students to um, also in a kind of active way set up their own debates between each other can, can encourage deep learning. So there are things like that that you can do that are encouraging. But the other thing that I would say does have a, a passion of the lecturer. If you as a lecturer are passionate about what you're teaching and you can get that passion over to your students so that they pick up on it and want to do more work and get as fascinated by it as you are, that can have a really big impact. Um, so don't, don't undervalue the, the, the impact that your relationship with students has. It really matters a lot to them. Um, and if you're passionate about the subject, they're more likely to pick it up as well. But, but scaffold it. Don't expect them to move to deep learning straight away. Have a, have a program, um, uh, plan your curriculum out to, to gradually move them through making them more and more independent and more and more deep learners as you go along rather than trying to move them from one to the other straight away because that they'll just be freaked out by that and, and push it away so step by step build that out but explain what you're doing that that, that explicit explanation of, of what it is and why you want them to do it over time drip by drip can just change their mind 
Thanks, Gareth. Um, so we have a question from Jenny now, um, and she would like to know, are there any tips that you have for positive uses of social media to help students connect in meaningful ways during the current, the current situation? Uh, I mean, social media is, a, is an interesting one because it is, um, on its own, it's a kind of neutral thing, really. It, it, social media is, is neither good nor bad for us, but the way we use it can be either really good or really bad. Um, some of it, I guess, is is about encouraging students to have a healthy relationship with it. Um, one of the things I talk to students about a lot is about setting rules around their social media use, about when they do it and when they don't do it, and to, to let other people know when they're not doing it so that other people don't think they're being ignored or gaslighted by a student who doesn't answer them. Particularly at, at night, so we, I get some students who get terrified of turning their phone off when they're going to sleep at night in case they get a message. I am, and I'm thinking, well, if you get a message at three in the morning, you should miss it. But they think that people will then not want to be their friends because they haven't responded straight away. So getting some rules around social media use is really important. Um, I think um, setting also then rules about communication on social media so that, you know, um, encouraging your students to, to not try and have emotionally difficult conversations by messaging, because actually the, 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 the room for misunderstanding is huge when that's going on. And that when we're emotionally aroused, don't forget the bit of our brain that does cognitive, the complex thinking gets switched off. We're much more likely to react in a black and white way and to misread what someone has sent through to us. And because you haven't got all those other cues, like seeing their face and stuff, that can be more difficult. So stepping back off that. Um, but also thinking about using social media to arrange meetings in real life as well. So you've got that contact on social media and also using it to arrange contact in real life. But, but some students do use this really positively and really well. And for some students, particularly students with autism, it can be a really valuable way of keeping in contact with other people without them then feeling overwhelmed by social situations. Or to begin conversations. Very often I'll say to students, you know, if you're nervous about talking to somebody, why not send them a message first? Because that feels less threatening than talking to them face to face. So you can use it as a step thing to build your relationship. And you can also use it to keep in contact with old networks. So if students have moved away from home, regular connection with family or friends, just the, the occasional message, the, the, the check in, the how, how are you, or the sharing what's going on in your day can help just to keep that connection up. But it's about, like everything else, it's about using it in balance and being mindful of how you use it. So encouraging your students to step back and think, okay, today, how, how was my use of social media? What have it benefited me? What have it made me feel good? What have it made me feel better? What if it made me feel not good? Did I spend time on it for ages, just wasting time and feeling my energy was going and feeling drained as a result? And then thinking about, okay, how can I shift that so that I'm using it rather than using it for, for kind of wasting time or feeling negative? Thanks, Gareth. So Joe from St. Andrews has asked, do you have any strategies for working through the stretch versus stress questions with your students? Um, I mean, this is difficult because your, where your students are going to be, well, they'll be in different places um, academically, particularly the beginning of first year. You know, you'll have a spectrum of where students are and, and where, what some students need to stretch them would stress other students out and so on. So I think this is why um, scaffolding the curriculum is so important. It's also why doing some early formative assessment is really important so that you can gauge where your students are and, and then can get a sense of where stretch might be. But also in terms of that interleaving of different levels of stretch, so that you know that thing that yoga teachers do this thing where they go, they put you into one position and then they go, and then you may want to stretch into this position, or if the, and if that feels okay, you may want to go into X position, and but it's okay to stay where you are in the first position if that's where you are today, and some of that with students about setting, this is this is what good would look like beyond it you could do this if you want to even go beyond that you could do this so that your students who find this easy have another place to go to and um, that I think can be a helpful thing it's not always possible but depending on what you're looking at the other thing I, I came across a really nice thing yesterday in a webinar I was doing for Advanced HE where someone has their, their program they've just decided that they're going to give students three shorter assignments to do but only two of them will count so that students can take a few more risks um, because if they get it really wrong on one of them it doesn't matter that will be the one that doesn't count so there's little that you can use but it really depends on your discipline again different things work in different areas and on your discipline um but again talk to students about it talk to students about what what is stretch what is stress where you want them to be what challenge is good um but it is that it is that Vygotsky thing again of trying to move into that proximal zone of development just outside the comfort zone 
but you need a sense of where your learners are to do that. So early formative assessment can help. Um, scaffold, build it in a structured way, and then give people different options. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions before finishing. So um, Sarah would like to know, does the book address the impact of student alcohol and substance use on learning and well-being? It's not going into it specifically. So for a, for a book like this, we, we've had to do something very general, obviously, and, and I wanted to write it for, for every student. And I would say that in the last 10 years, um, the level of particularly alcohol dependency in the student population that we've seen generally probably feels a bit lower than it, than it once was. So it, it wasn't a key focus. It gets a few brief references, but, but it's not a main reference. Um, I would say that what it does talk about though is about balance and about trying to find that balance in, in your lifestyle and in your behaviours and your activities. So if we think about where so the majority of traditional student drinking that we would think about occurs is that party and that going out constantly. And that if you do that a lot, that will clearly have a negative impact on your academic performance overall. So it's not saying don't do it ever, but it is saying it needs to be in balance with other things and it needs to be in balance right across. So again, you can't spend the first six weeks of first year partying and then expect to pick up your academic program at week six and be okay. So it, it does talk about those aspects of, of finding balance. Um, it's a bit tricky. You would have to write something a bit more in depth if you wanted to start writing about alcohol and drug dependency and addiction and things like that. So um, it's probably for, for another piece of work or for students to, to access support to work on that specifically. But I think that the, the stuff around balance is really important. Great. So um, David would like to know a lot of um, so a lot of academics feel that well-being is an area outside of their, their remit. How would you persuade them otherwise? I think there's something valid in what they're saying, though. So let, let's just be quite clear about this, because um, we, we've done some research in this. And it's very clear that a lot of academics are being pushed into a role in supporting student mental health, which is beyond their role, which is beyond their capability and, and shouldn't be uh, what they're being asked to do. So we want academics to care about their students, um, because that relationship we know is, is really powerful in terms of both student learning and student uh, well-being overall. But actually, the, the way academics can generally best support student well-being is by teaching well and by supporting learning well. So if you think about the, the, the meta-learning aspects we've just talked about, helping students understand what good effective learning looks like, spacing, retrieval techniques, helping them move into deep learning, helping them find meaning and purpose in what they're learning, those things will benefit the well-being of your students overall. Um, and I guess the other thing about this though is that, that we cannot disentangle academic and learning from well-being. So whenever we want our students, if we want our students to improve academically, if we want them to perform better, we do have to be aware that what we want, it's a person who's going to have to perform better, it's a person who's going to have to learn, and that means their well-being is going to be a factor in this. So if as a lecturer you think, I don't care about well-being, and what you do is you have a curriculum that's really stressful and drives high levels of anxiety, and make students scared and make students think about dropping out, you're going to have students on that program who are going to underperform. Not because they weren't good enough, not because they weren't academically capable, but because your, your curriculum is designed for someone, not for people. You, you have a curriculum that's not designed for human beings. So we need to design our curriculum for how human beings actually function and who our students actually are, not who we wish they were, who are the students actually coming through the door. So for all of those reasons, we do need to have our academics thinking about well-being within the design of their curriculum, where we can encourage them to do sensible self-management. Let's take the well-being label off it. Self-management about sleep, timekeeping, having a good structure, those kinds of things that are also going to be really important for employability skills later on and for their personal development later on. Um, if we can encourage all of that and model it and talk about it, that will benefit student well-being. But I think it's fair enough for academics to not want to necessarily be talking to students about their mental health in great depth beyond listening, hearing it, understanding, and then signposting them onto the services who need it, because it isn't their role. Um, and I think it can cause all kinds of problems when academics try and take on too much. So we need to be compassionate, we need to be empathetic, we need to listen, and then we need to guide students to the support services who can help. And then for academics to take the stuff that, that does sit with them, which is, helping students be more confident about their learning, developing self-efficacy, developing that attribution, we're recognizing the work they've done well, feeling more confident and learning well, because that's the stuff that then will boost their well-being. Thanks, Gareth. 
Um, Abney would like to know, does your book include worked or examples of various things to try out? Yes, it does. So one of the things that I've done within the book is I've used what's called the law of scatter, which is you throw out lots and lots and lots of options. Because as I said, different things work for different people. No, no two people are the same. And what works brilliantly for one person will not work at all for the next person. So I've given lots of options. Um, in, if you think about all of those areas in terms of physical, psychological, social, and academic. And we also then look at specific academic um, experiences and, and, and tasks. So we look at things like group work, exam anxiety, public speaking presentation anxiety, writer's block. Um, uh, and then we look at thinking about the future afterwards as well. And we look and, we, and there are specific examples of things that students can do to improve their well-being and learning in all of those things. And we talk about, so with exams, we talk about exam anxiety and good academic preparation and good personal preparation. So we talk about all of those things together as, as, as strategies towards better uh, well-being and better learning and performance because it's, because it's all linked. So yeah, there's, there's lots of examples of things students can pick up. The key thing what, what, that I emphasize throughout the book is we don't want students trying to do them all. We want them to pick one or two small things to begin with that they can put in place now, get those into their lives, get those into structure, routine, and habits so they don't have to think about it anymore, and then pick another couple and work in that way rather than trying to change everything at once. Because when students try to do everything at once, they just get overwhelmed if it's too much, and then they give up because it just feels like it, 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 it's too much for them. So yeah, lots of examples, lots of practical examples for students to pick up and use. Wonderful. Thanks, Gareth. Well, um, sadly, I think that's that's all we have time for today. Um, but if you are looking for some more information on Gareth's book, then I would urge you to visit our website, where you can also uh, read a sample chapter and download that to your computer for reading. Um, you can pre-order the title, um, and you can also request an inspection copy if you would like to as well. Um, okay, so once you've received your recording, please do feel free to share this with your peers. Um, yeah, so thanks again, Gareth, for joining us. Um, and I do hope everyone has a fantastic weekend. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.